We're back here on the Morning Brew where we've kept the spotlight on the COVID-19 situation uh, here at home and in the region uh, for much of this, the first hour of the show. Uh, we've got on the line with us uh, Chairman of the UE COVID-19 Task Force, Professor Clive Landis. We're so happy that he's uh, able to join us this morning. Good morning to you, Professor. Good morning to, from Barbados to everyone in Trinidad. All right, Professor, um, quickly, uh, you got your COVID-19 vaccine. Everything went up without a hitch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As of yesterday, we would have had over 30, 34,000 people here in Trinidad and Tobago vaccinated, getting their first doses. So uh, we seem to be on our way. But of course, there is a challenge happening internationally with vaccine production because of what's happening in India. Can we look at the implications of that for us here in the region for a moment? Sure, sure. Well, you know, it's a um, irony and right now a fairly tragic irony that um, India is the largest vaccine manufacturer in the world. Um, but most of those vaccines, you know, would be uh, manufactured on contract for um, uh, pharmaceutical companies um, uh, uh, in, in other countries. Um, and India's uh, take up of vaccines has been relatively low, you know, around about 8% or so of the population is vaccinated. Uh, and unfortunately, of course, um, India is right now going through an extremely tragic, um, uh, huge uh, second wave. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor, uh, recently, as in within the last week or so, we would have been getting alerts from uh, Pahu and Karfa with regard to the presence of the P1 variant, also known as the Brazilian variant, showing up here in the Americas. Uh, we here in Trinidad and Tobago would have had about three or four cases show up with the P1 variant. And the people are beginning to be very, very concerned, especially since the science is is showing that the vaccines may not be as effective against it as we would have hoped that this variant has found a way to mutate to escape um, you know the power of the vaccine can you explain what's involved there for us uh, well I would have to disagree with your statement um, okay the p1 uh, variant is uh, quite susceptible to the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer vaccines it seems to behave relatively similarly to the UK variant as it comes to those two vaccines. We, of course, here in the region have AstraZeneca. So for most of what I talk about, I'll just be talking about AstraZeneca. And so it is true that um, the neutralizing antibodies required to neutralize um, both the UK variant and the P1 variant um, are about three times as high as would normally be needed for the previous variant. However, the, uh, it's, it's still very effective. And so when you look at the data in the UK, where of course um, the latest data that was published just two days ago in the British Medical Journal, um, that covered the quite large second wave that the UK had with the UK variant. And, and as I said, it behaves very similarly to the P1 variant from Brazil with respect to the AstraZeneca vaccine. And yet the AstraZeneca vaccine has performed extremely well. Uh, so similar to what I've been saying for several months, the data is just consolidating around this figure of around about two thirds of all infections are stopped and onward transmission is stopped. And even those one third who might be infected, they just don't end up in hospital and they don't die. And so it's almost 100% effective at preventing death. So right now in the UK, uh, a third of all hospitals have no COVID cases in their ICUs at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, but there has been uh, some signs that people who would previously have contracted COVID-19 in Brazil um, found themselves being reinfected again because of the mutation that happened with the P1 variant. That is correct, yes. Yeah, that's something that we need to be concerned about, though. Uh, well, yes, um, if you've been previously infected with the uh, uh, another variant um, and you're not uh, vaccinated <laughs> then um, you know that that is a possibility now in Trinidad because um, it's had very low case numbers it doesn't really matter whether you get infected with the original uh, virus or the variant because you know it's not like Manaus where two-thirds of people were actually got infected and had a huge death rate um, in the first wave and then they were reinfected with this new variant and so you know having had the previous infection didn't protect them. But in Trinidad, because you've had very, very low case numbers, um, 
you're really just at the point where you have a naive population, whether you get infected with variant A, B, or C, it doesn't really matter. It's all the messages and all the measures that you take are all the same. One, get vaccinated now that we have a vaccine that's available and it's effective against the P1 variant and the UK variant and the original variant. And, and two, of course, uh, you know, you have all of the social distancing measures um, uh, and hand washing protocols, you know, which will protect you. So really nothing has changed. Many are questioning, though, whether those, um, you know, the basic toolkit, which is the mask wearing, the sanitizing, and the physical distancing, if that basic toolkit can really protect us, given how quickly um, the P1 variant has a tendency to spread. Your, your well, thoughts and assurances? Uh, well, it can, absolutely. Um, but it just reinforces the need to actually go through with them, uh, those measures. So, you know, when you look at the uh, situation in India, um, where they had a very large first wave, and it really just calmed down um, to the point where I, I think at all levels, both at the government level and uh, at the population level, people thought, well, I think we've got this one beaten. Um, and there's no question that um, there was um, a loosening of uh, all of those measures and masks went out the window and uh, you know look where India is now so you know those measures do work and uh, it simply reinforces the need to, to to go through with them but but I want to just say this we can't live with these kind of measures forever it's impossible our, our life our society our economy is just going to be crushed um, the answer is the vaccines and you know uh, the situation in the UK um, is the roadmap. That is the roadmap that we need to follow because they're using the same uh, vaccine that we are. And, you know, <laughs> when you look at what's happened there, it's just remarkable. Um, we went from 1,200 cases, uh, sorry, deaths a day in January. And right now you're in single figures, four or five deaths a day. And, you know, and, and every single week, everything is coming down by about a quarter. Mm. Uh, Professor, as you as you point out what's happened in the UK and now we're seeing what's happening with India, there are people who are concerned that the variants in India, because India has registered so many different variants, that they could also become a concern for us here in the region, uh, given the, the, the historic and economic ties that we have with India here in the Caribbean. Your Absolutely. thoughts? If I had to reserve some concern, um, then it would not really be with the P1 variant. It would be with the so-called Indian double mutant. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a case of convergent evolution where uh, there was a particular mutation at position 484 that was already seen in some variants that spread more quickly in California. There was another mutation at position 452 that was noted in the South African variant and uh, you know seem to lead to the ability to be reinfected and, and actually both of those um, have turned up in this Indian variant and of course with the connections that Trinidad has to India it certainly would be in my view a bigger uh, concern but I have to say we don't really know much about the Indian variant yet uh, we don't really know how effective the vaccines are um, and uh, you know the reinfection rate a lot of this is still unknown and there is you know I think concern because it's clear that it's more contagious, um, but we don't really know yet um, uh, whether people can be reinfected um, or whether the vaccine uh, works as well. We just, we just don't really know that yet. Well, I guess I guess your fellow scientists are probably working to get us that uh, information as soon as possible, so that we can all be armed with the necessary information to deal with it. Uh, as we as we see um, different countries battling with the surges, second and third waves, uh, we find ourselves in this final week of April observing World Immunization Week, which is very apropos given what's happening on the planet right now, where COVID nineteen is concerned. And um, the, the various bodies highlighting World Immunization Week have said that, you know, for 200 years, vaccines have protected us. Um, and it's, it's made our life, our modern life possible. And we should continue to trust vaccines mm -hmm. to get us through the pandemic and sure. beyond. Mm -hmm. Yes, Professor? No, absolutely. You know, uh, here in the Caribbean, we have um, uh, very, you know, beautiful uh, history of vaccination in for childhood diseases and we eliminated you know a whole raft of childhood diseases in, in the Caribbean that we just don't see anymore 
Um, and so, you know, vaccinations have been a remarkable success um, uh, in our region and, and across the world. Um, you know, when you look at the uh, tuberculosis um, uh, vaccination, that's the one where they sort of scrape your arm and you get this little lump. Um, well, you know, just in the 21st century alone, just in the first 20 years, uh, 58 million lives across the world were saved from, from that vaccine, from, from TB. And that vac vaccine's been with us for 100 years. It's the same one, still effective. Mm. Uh, however, we do have a challenge where COVID-19 is concerned in terms of many national vaccination programs because um, uh, it has impacted, um, you know, government's abilities to carry out those vaccination programs. There is probably a generation of children who would have been born within the last year who may not have been able to access much needed critical vaccinations uh, to ensure that they would have a fairly disease-free childhood. Your thoughts, Professor? It really impacted the Caribbean uh, as much, but uh, if you go back to TB, uh, 1.8 million um, deaths uh, last year are estimated to have been caused in Africa because people missed their uh, TB va uh, vaccine. So, you know, the vaccines are the answer. And of course, the problem that we have in the Caribbean is, is really uh, a problem of access, like the rest of the world. But there are countries that are sitting on um, supplies of vaccines that even by their own admission, they may not need. Uh, so if you take, for example, uh, the US, uh, Anthony Fauci, you know, indicated that there are 15 million AstraZeneca vaccines. And in his words, they may not be needed. Uh, he made clear that um, it, he didn't have anything against the AstraZeneca vaccine. It's safe and effective, uh, but they may not need it. And so we would uh, certainly uh, uh, support the call by CARICOM and by Keith Rowley um, for countries that have uh, surpluses to to share those uh, with uh, the developing world and with the Caribbean. Rather than letting them uh, go bad. Um, Expire, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the other vaccines that are being developed, I'm talking about the Cuban vaccine and um, the Chinese vaccine. The Chinese vaccine appearing to show um, some efficacy against the P1 variant, um, but that's not fully conclusive yet based on, um, based on what I've read. Well, the, there are a number of vaccines on the table here. Um, so the Cuban vaccine, uh, all we know at the moment is that it's in phase three trials and we know what it is. It's, it's a very exciting vaccine. It's very high tech. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a protein expression vaccine and I'm excited by it. I'm really look, looking forward to the uh, results of the um, clinical trial. And, you know, I fully expect that it'll be efficacious. It, it, it seems quite similar to the Novavax uh, vaccine, which was shown to be very efficacious. In terms of the P1 variant, um, we don't know anything about the Cuban uh, vaccine, uh, how that performs against the P1, uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, there is one uh, vaccine called CanSino, which um, has been used extensively in Chile. And Chile, you know, is really the, um, uh, I think it's the case where you have to uh, learn lessons, uh, where vaccines um, uh, need to be rolled out, but you can't just let let rip with your economy at the same time because they have a very high proportion of persons vaccinated uh, similar to the uk and yet they've had a big surge of cases now it could be due to the vaccine being used because that is a heat killed vaccine and it's generally uh, well known that uh, heat killed vaccines um, they do require the second shot to have eff efficacy the figures which i quoted to you earlier about two-thirds efficacy for pfizer and astrazeneca after one shot and so, you know, uh, in the case of the CanSino vaccine, um, again, we haven't seen the, the real-time data and how effective it is against the P1. Um, uh, but, you know, there is a big surge in cases in Chile. Um, I think everyone agrees that, that Chile reopened too quickly. And I think the way to do it is to, um, is to do it like, like the UK had a very clear... Um, I go back to the UK just because I think you know, people are saying, how are we going to get out of this? And I'm, uh, I think UK has shown how you get out of it. You maintain your protocols and you vaccinate, and then you just gradually loosen the protocols and the case is just coming down and down. Uh, Professor Landis, for those who are still of two minds with regard to taking the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, a final word from you on that, a word of, of assurance. Well, you know, maybe just look at India. What would you prefer? 
you know, it's really, really tragic what's going on in India, and my heart bleeds. Um, you know, and, and when this first pandemic first broke, uh, over a year ago, the, U, the uh, UE, we did models, we did um, epidemic modeling for all CARICOM countries, and we, we showed countries where their surge capacity in hospital beds and ICU beds is, and what could happen. And we did it under three scenarios, do nothing, act early or act late. And, you know, um, we don't know how much our modeling impacted all the decision makers, but for Barbados, which has a open data policy, they showed these models quite freely. And they said, this is why we acted early, because we were just scared that our healthcare capacity could just be overwhelmed. Mm. Professor Landis, we're going to leave it there for now, but we do appreciate you giving us some time this morning. Uh, thanks so much um, for the latest data. And we look forward to chatting with you again in the not too distant future as we continue to track the COVID-19 pandemic here in the region. Okay. Well, well good luck with your vaccinations. Thank you. All right. And that's it for this first hour of the Morning Brew. News is up next.